So good evening and uh, welcome to Saving Our Trees, Preventing Imported Forest Pests. Uh, it's great to have you with us. Uh, in a second, I will know what proportion of you are new to Carrie, but let me do a two second, yeah, 10 second uh, thumbnail sketch. Carrie Institute is an independent research institute focusing on large scale ecological problems. We are based in Millbrook, New York, about 100 miles north of New York City. And our areas of expertise include, but are not limited to, freshwater forests, which will be the topic of tonight's conversation, uh, disease ecology and urban ecology. I like to say that if you're an ecologist working at a large scale, uh, there is no way you can avoid climate change, and we are all climate change biologists. Um, it's a real pleasure to have such a distinguished panel tonight. Um, Gary Lovett, uh, Dr. Gary Lovett's on the panel, and Gary is an emeritus scientist at Cary. Um, maybe six, seven years ago, Gary started a multidisciplinary project uh, with a group called the Science Policy Exchange, which brought together scientists, econo economists, and planners to really pull together our knowledge of the ecology and impacts, both social and economic, of invasive uh, pests and pathogens. That resulted in a paper in 2016, because that's what we scientists do, we publish papers. But on the same day, Gary and his colleagues released a policy brief uh, which launched the Tree Smart Trade Initiative um, uh, at Cary, which Gary has led and devoted much of his time to in the last five years when he hasn't been running the Hubbard Brook uh, Long-Term Ecological Research Program uh, and working in the Catskills and doing a few other things. Um, we also have with us tonight, Susan Frankel. Susan works for the USDA Forest Service uh, as a sudden oak death, uh, sudden oak death researcher um, and uh, at the Pacific Southwest Research Station in Albany. For those of you who are Northeasterners, that is not Albany, New York, that is Albany, California. Um, she also works on understanding, as I said, how climate influences forest diseases. We are all climate scientists and preventing uh, pests and pathogens from invading and restoration projects. Uh, she's interested more generally in forest health and the long-term trends of, of forests. Um, Faith Campbell, Dr. Faith Campbell, was also an author on that 2016 paper. Uh, Faith has had a really distinguished career working on these and other forest-related issues with a number of national and international organizations, including the Natural Resources Defense Council, the Nature Conservancy, the National Association of Exotic Plants, Pest Plants and Councils, which is now the National Association of Invasive Plant Councils. And she is the president of the Center for Invasive Species Prevention. Um, as you can see, we have expertise that is deep and wide. And, and I'm just going to uh, make sure I keep my notes up to date so I don't miss anything. Finally, um, moderating the panel tonight is Gabe Popkin. Uh, Gabe is a really distinguished independent environmental journalist. As we are not part of any university, Gabe does not work for a single uh, news or media outlet. He is published widely in places like the Washington Post, National Geographic, Science, Nature, Smithsonian, and the New York Times. Uh, so as you can see, he is a distinguished author. Uh, and in the Times, he recently published an article on the op-ed page entitled, Invasive Insects and Diseases Are Killing Our Forests. Uh, it's a great article, both for its clarity but also I really think anyone who can uh, get a headline that is that clear uh, and that declarative really uh, deserves respect. So I'm gonna have um, Gabe uh, take over from me and just say it is a real pleasure that 64% of you have not attended a carry event before. We will be emailing you a link to this. Please send it to all your friends and family. Um, and uh, we really appreciate you're coming tonight, and I hope you will enjoy this as much as I hope I will. Okay, have a good night, and thanks, Gabe. It's yours. Thanks. Thanks so much for the kind introduction, Josh. And I'll just say I, I didn't actually write that headline, so uh, <laughs> maybe the New York Times headline writer should be here instead of me, but you have me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I've been covering this area for about eight years as a journalist, and in that time, I've really been struck at First of all, how big of an impact these invasive pests can have on our trees. And secondly, how little coverage they get compared to some of the other threats that um, are out there, such as climate change, as Josh mentioned, uh, wildfires. Th these things pop up on the, uh, in the news, uh, make big headlines pretty reliably every year, 
whereas um, some of these invasive pests, these insects and diseases are, are really kind of still somewhat unknown, I think, to the public. Um, so hopefully we'll make some progress on that tonight. And I'll just um, jump right in. Um, so I'm sure a number of these uh, insects and pathogens that we'll be talking about are familiar to many of you. Um, chestnut blight has been around for more than 100 years, basically wiped out the chestnut tree, the American chestnut, as a significant tree in the forest. Dutch elm disease um, is similar to the American elm, um, big impacts in cities. Today we have hemlock willy adelgid and emerald ash borer going after our hemlock and ash trees in a big way. And kind of an emerging threat is this beech leaf disease going after American beech trees. It seems to be caused by a nematode, still pretty mysterious. A lot of research to be done there. Um, so I want to just set the stage by hearing from our panelists how did we get here? Um, why are we seeing all these um, invaders coming from abroad that are having big impacts? And what are the impacts? I mean, what happens when a tree gets wiped out from the forest? What happens to the larger ecosystem? So Gary, I, I think I'd um, like to ask you to speak first and then we'll hear from the other panelists. Yeah, thanks Gabe. And, and you're absolutely right that uh, it's been it's been a long road to get here. This is not this is not a new problem. Um, as you mentioned, the chestnut blight and the Dutch elm disease in in the last century, chestnut blight in particular wiped out or nearly wiped out one of our major tree species. Uh, so that happened to chestnut and elm in, in the last century. That's what's happening to ash right now. We're going to lose uh, not only species but a, a, a genus of trees from North America. Essentially, 95 to 99 percent of those trees will die. That's the ash genus. So uh, this is a continuing problem, but it is not a new problem. Uh, we've been importing forest pests into the country for as long as we've been having international trade. And it, 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 these, these pests uh, accumulate in our forests. We now have something like 450 uh, uh, invasive uh, insects and diseases uh, in our forests. And uh, they keep arriving at a rate of um, 26 per decade or so. And they, like I said, they accumulate. So once they're here, they don't go away. And we're still dealing with pests that were imported in the 1800s. I just, I just saw an article in the newspaper today about counties in, in Pennsylvania that are spraying against the gypsy moth. They want to stop an outbreak of gypsy moth. Gypsy moth was imported into the country in 1869. So, and it's still a problem today. So these, these uh, bugs keep accumulating in our forests. And uh, the ways that they get here these days are primarily through uh, wooden packaging material. That's, uh, well, they come in on international shipping. You can see this image up here now. Much of our material comes into the country. Much of the cargo comes into the country um, on these uh, large boats with uh, shipping, shipping containers on them. And many of those shipping containers have wooden packaging material like crates and pallets inside and bugs can be burrowed into those crates and pallets. And that's, that's one way they get here. We'll talk a little bit about that later on, I'm sure. Um, and the other main pathway is live plants that are brought in for the horticultural trade. You talked about impacts. We see the impacts in all sorts of ways. We see it in biodiversity. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, the loss of the trees themselves is an impact on biodiversity. But as we lose whole tree species or whole genera, uh, there are, are usually other tree species there that will replace it. So the forest may uh, stay green, at least after a while, after it recovers from that death, uh, but uh, the tree species composition has changed. And of course, in the process of killing those trees and altering the tree species composition, that reverberates through the entire ecosystem. It affects the birds, it affects the insects, it affects the other plants, it affects the mammals, just everything about the ecosystem can change when you change the tree species composition. We also know it has an impact on carbon sequestration. We hear a lot about uh, carbon uh, storage in our forests uh, as we try to fight climate change. Uh, we just finished a study that showed that, uh, that we estimated that uh, insects and diseases reduce the carbon sequestration of US forests uh, by an amount that's equivalent to putting an extra 10 million cars on the road every year. So it's, it, they cause a big impact on the ability of our forests to sequester carbon, to, to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it in a way that's not harmful. 
but this affects people too. They, they communities lose their trees in streets and yards and parks. Um, and that's very expensive because the, the communities, those trees that are dead are dangerous and the homeowners or the municipalities have to take them down. And so municipalities and homeowners bear the largest cost of, of these, the importation of these pests. And not only is it an economic impact in these cities, it affects the community character and the quality of life. And, and recent studies also show that losing the trees, the city's trees, uh, street trees in particular, affects human health in the cities, also affects crime rates. You mentioned a couple of new, new pests that are coming. I just want to very briefly say that there have been some really some recent outbreaks that are quite scary, actually. Uh, the image on the left there is beech leaf disease, which you mentioned that's caused by a nematode. It's a tiny microscopic worm uh, that gets inside the leaf uh, and, and hollows out the cells inside, causes that striping pattern you see on a beech, uh, beech leaf on your left. This was first discovered in 2012 uh, near Cleveland, Ohio. It spread throughout the Southern Great Lakes. It hopped over to Canada, so it's in Ontario now. It also hopped over to Long Island in New York, Connecticut, uh, and it is in uh, the Hudson Valley of New York, not too far from where we are at the Cary Institute. This is affecting beech, American beech, which is a major tree species in our northern forests. And that's, that tree species is also being affected by another disease, beech bark disease. So this is sort of a double whammy for that, for that tree. The one in the middle there, spotted lanternfly, that was uh, imported in 2014 uh, in Pennsylvania on a shipment of stone that came in from, from China. Uh, this is, it's uh, not a fly, it is a plant hopper type bug. Uh, it sucks the juices out of the stems of, of trees. Uh, we know it attacks a lot of different hardwood trees. We don't yet know how lethal it is on those trees, but we do know that it's very damaging to apples and grapes. And so the orchards and vineyards in Pennsylvania have seen a major hit from this pest. It has now spread into the adjacent states. It's in Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and it is in New York also. And it's likely to continue to spread. Uh, and the one on the right is the Asian long-arm beetle. Just this past summer, we had a new outbreak of this very dangerous pest. That's a very large wood boring beetle uh, that uh, uh, attacks a number of hardwood trees, but its, but it's uh, most, its favorite hosts are maple trees, which are the dominant trees in the Northeastern US. Uh, it keeps being imported on wooden packaging material. We have outbreaks, uh, at, we've had outbreaks in the past at several places in the US, New York, New Jersey, Chicago. Uh, there's a current outbreaks going on in Worcester, Massachusetts and Cincinnati, Ohio. And so it just keeps popping up. And now we've just had a new outbreak in South Carolina. So those three are very scary new pests. And so the point here is that this problem is continuing. It's not going away. I'll just stop there. Maybe, maybe Faith or, or Susan has something to add there. Well, I would add Gary, I mean, that's a scary list, but import volumes are going up. Uh, despite the pandemic, we imported more last year than in any previous year. Everyone expects the quantity to continue rising. And we rely to a large extent on inspection to, to try to detect these pests, especially the ones on plants, and it doesn't work. It's too difficult to find tiny insect eggs or pathogens, of course, are microscopic. You can't see them. And if the plants don't happen to be diseased at the time they're imported, you don't, you don't know, you don't catch it. Susan, anything to add or should we go on? Um, I think we're good for now. Great. And just to add one, you know, I think very evocative um, impact that the emerald ash borer is having. There's a, um, the, the native tribes of the Northeast and the Midwest um, have a sort, of, sort of a shared basket making tradition that really depends on one species, the black ash tree. And that tree is um, severely threatened. It, it really completely vulnerable to the, to the ash borer. And um, I think that it's already had major impacts in the Northeast and it's, about to start probably in the Midwest. So to me, that really shows how these invasive pests can affect culture um, and you know very old traditions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so good. you know, the next question I had was um, this sort of curious situation because we know our forests are already are full of insects. 
pull a fungi, you, anybody who goes on a walk in a forest will no, notice that. And yet, these don't. Most of these don't seem to cause problems. And in fact, they're they're good. They're often good. Um, entomologist Doug Tallamy has found more than 500 species of native caterpillar that live on white oak trees and feed our native birds. But nobody's saying that we need to save the oak trees from the caterpillars. So why is it that when uh, an insect or a pathogen is imported from abroad, this can often cause much bigger problems? Um, Susan, could you uh, speak a little bit to this? Yeah. So really, invasives, it's all about problems of globalization and shipping. When new organisms come, they don't have any natural predators in these new ecosystems when they arrive. And the forests that are there, um, they're kind of what we call a naive population. They've never been exposed to these problems before. It's a little like humans with COVID. You know, we don't have, have never had the opportunity to develop resistance. You know, over time, uh, both the pests and the population of plants uh, adapt, but it's a very painful, really heartbreaking chain of events that often occurs. Um, you know, it is remarkable to me that with the number of imported, I'm particularly focused on nursery plant importations. Um, so many insects and pathogens come in and really very small number um, actually cause problems, which you know, is somewhat surprising that there aren't more. Um, but the ones that do, oftentimes, once they get established, we just can't stop them. You know, they're here, and as Gary mentioned, they're accumulating, moving around. And we do see shifts as the, you know, if we bring in more things from Asia, we start getting Asian pathogens that, you know, pathogens that are in insect pests from Asia. When we used to do more from Europe, we got more of those. And unfortunately, we actually ship um, insects and pests to China. And they have, you know, Chinese and um, many other countries have some of our native pests causing invasive type problems there as well. I'm glad you mentioned that. I think that that uh, detail often gets lost in these discussions that this is a, a two way street. Um, Gary or Faith, anything to add? I think she Go ahead, Faith. No, no, I think Susan covered it quite well. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was going to say my, my impression uh, from talking to Chinese scientists that, is that the number of pests that we have from Asia here in, uh, in the U.S. is much greater and they cause a much greater problem than the pests that the American pests that they have in China, and I, I assume that it's because the I don't have any numbers to support that, but that's just the impression I got. I assume that the balance of pests is kind of like the balance of trade, that there's a lot more stuff coming into the country than there is going out. Do you guys, do either of you know if that's true or? You have yeah, I don't impression? really know, but I know part of the problem is when insects are moved, they often harbor fungi on them. So, you know, into these new areas, you get not only an insect, but you also get a fungus associate with it and you know one or the other can become a problem yeah yeah well gary i think you're right that we import so much well for 400 500 years almost 450 years we've been importing things from overseas and particularly in the last 30 40 years the volume and the variety of things that we import has shot right up yeah. and that just creates many more opportunities for organisms that originate in somewhere else, Asia, mm -hmm. Europe, and probably increasingly Africa and South America and whatnot, get brought here. And a lot of our exports are services or something else. And if you're exporting a, a computer program or a, a banking system, it's highly unlikely to carry it. <laughs> A pest or a, an insect or a pathogen with it. Um, so the the different shapes of trade really make a difference. Yeah. We opened trade with China in like 1980 
and just think how many critters we've had introduced from China in 40 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. It doesn't, it happens quickly. <laughs> There's also, uh, you know, problems with Canada and Mexico, you know, True. the countries where we have borders. And particularly like Southern California, we've got these weevils coming in and attacking really beautiful palms. And um, with Canada, it's all kinds of things moving across the border. Nursery stock, trading, pests. Yeah. I say I think this is a great segue to our next question because um, you know we've talked a lot somewhat about live plants and um, maybe like 100 150 years ago there was just kind of this period where American plant prospectors went out and um, went out and brought in all kinds of things. It was considered a, a great thing to do to introduce new plants into the country. Uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture was actually a major uh, player in this. Um, and then it, it became clear that there were, there could be consequences such as chestnut blight, which showed up in New York in, in 1904. And um, the agriculture department, which is also responsible for protecting plants here in the country, realized that they needed to take action over time to realize this. And now we have, um, you know, quite a, um, you know, well-developed, or at least, um, you know, a lot of thought has gone into our plant protection system. And some of our newer pests, such as emerald ash borer, come in not on live plants, but through different routes. So the question I'm getting at is um, the plant industry, the agriculture department say that they've recognized the threat from live plants. They've um, instituted this regu regulatory system. Um, they've, they, they would argue they've sort of reduce the threat quite a bit. Um, how worried should we be about new pests coming into the country on live plants today? Faith, I know you uh, work a lot on this issue. So uh, yeah, thanks, Gabe. Uh, well, clearly we're better off than we were in the, far, in the way of regulations and we're better off than Europe, <laughs> but we still are getting huge volumes of plants coming in. Um, According to the USDA, we imported a 1.8 million, a billion, sorry, B billion plant units in 2019. Um, some of those were bulbs and some of them were other small things, but we're importing tons and tons of plants. And a, a study a decade ago found that USDA inspectors um, pictured there in the little box or now the big box, um, they try their dangest, but they're still missing 72% of the uh, pests that were actually on the plants coming in. Now, USDA says they've improved their techniques, but we don't have recent data to back that up. So there's still a, a high risk that pests are coming in on imported plants. We've talked some about Asia and it's definitely an area of great concern, partly because Many of the trees and shrubs in our forests are related to the trees and shrubs in Asia. So when the pests do arrive, they find a host that's familiar to them and they can utilize it. Um, but USDA is not, from my point of view, they're not using the powers that they have sufficiently aggressively. They have a program that allows them to prohibit importation of plants that they think are likely to transport a pest, but it takes years for a species to get included in that uh, prohibited list. And in the meantime, they are not doing, they're not actively pursuing science to determine which of the pathogens or insects in foreign countries might pose a threat to our plants. There are academic scientists, scientists from Europe who've identified, for example, 38 different kinds of the pathogen that causes sudden oak death or related ones. And USDA is making no effort to determine which of those might threaten our oaks or rhododendrons or other important plants. And uh, they are just barely starting now some parts of USDA to support what are called sentinel gardens, planting of our trees or shrubs in foreign countries and then keeping careful track of 
how many of them get attacked and what attacks them so that we'll have advanced notice of what might be risky. So there's a lot more that USDA could be doing to make its preventive efforts more effective. Yeah, I wanted to add, um... You know, a lot of the problem lies in the economics of growing plants. I mean, plants are really relatively inexpensive. And uh, depending on, um, you know, if you're buying them retail or if they're a big restoration project. So the growers uh, don't have a lot of wiggle room in their budgets to, you know, make changes in their growing patterns that could... Um, reduce pathogens or insect development. And then they try to rely on um, pesticides and you can you know, treat a, a plant with a pesticide right before it leaves your nursery, you could sell it and the, path the pests can develop you know, just a month or two later. So really we're working hard um, on trying to develop like accreditation programs. And I know the USDA and the plant board, National Plant Board, they're all working on what they call SANC. Um, what does SANC stand for, Faith? Do you remember? Uh, sort of systematic assessment of uh, nursery. Nursery, nursery uh, um, yeah, sorry, blanking on that. Anyway, you know, people do really care but when the bottom line hits, it's tough on the nursery growers to really grow clean plants. Great, great discussion. Um, so Gary, you earlier mentioned, um, you showed that picture of the, uh, the ship and pointed out that many of those containers probably contain wood. And this, is, this has obviously been a major pathway for pests to get into the country, emerald ash borer, the worst forest pest ever to arrive in North America, almost certainly came in this way. Um, but here too, the, um, our government has taken some action. Um, some people would say it's sort of addressed the threat or at least significantly addressed it. Um, but I know that in your Tree Start Smart Trade program, you call for kind of additional steps to really mitigate this threat. So could you tell us a little bit about what has been done and what you feel like still needs to be done? Yeah, there's a, an international treaty that requires that what we call solid wood packing material, which includes crates and pallets and spools and all sorts of things that are made out of solid wood. Uh, it requires that they be treated so to, to kill the pests that are inside them. Um, Unfortunately, research has shown that it, it's the, the, okay, so this international treaty put this, this uh, uh, treatment procedure in place. Basically, the, the materials have to be either heat treated or fumigated, and then they have to be stamped to show that they're treated. Uh, and there was some research uh, in the US showing that the, this policy, putting this treatment procedure in place, um, showed that it's between 36 and 52% effective. So basically it ge generally gets less than half of the pests out of the wood packaging material. So 36 and 50, between 36 and 52%, that's, that's helpful, uh, but it's clearly not sufficient, especially if the number of these things, of importations of these things is going up. Um, and a, a follow on to that study or a calculation from that study showed that you know, with the rate at which these materials are coming into the country, we import something like 25 million shipping containers into this country every year. And, and most of them have wood packaging material in it. Uh, that provides, even with this, this infestation rate reduced by this uh, policy, it provides somewhere around 13,000 opportunities for new pests to get into the country. 13,000 infested shipments are coming into the country every year. So that's a lot. So we, the, the international uh, um, community has tried to solve this problem, but it, it's not sufficient. It, it becomes a really thorny problem because something like 95% of the pallets being used in, in international trade today are made out of solid wood. So it's not like it's just a small portion of the, of the market. So changing from something other than, uh, to something other than solid wood would be a, a heavy lift. And also wood, wood's a good material when you think about it. It's widely available, it's relatively cheap, it's recyclable, it's biodegradable. So you know, there's reason to want to use wood. The problem is it's really dangerous to ship it internationally 
because of the pests that can be in it. So we have to think about it as a very dangerous commodity to be shipped. Um, so one solution is to, is to uh, shift to pest-free materials for pallets and crates, uh, like manufactured wood products, like pot, uh, plywood and things like that, or even recycled plastics in, in some cases. Uh, and that's one of the suggestions we have in our Tree Smart Trade uh, policy uh, manual or, or policy brochure that we put out. Uh, some companies have done away with pallets altogether. Uh, and so that's, that's a, a possibility also. So there, there's possible solutions here. But another approach is to focus on stronger enforcement of the regulations that we have. So I said that this, this uh, procedure that was put in place internationally uh, was supposed to solve this problem, but it's only 36 to 52% effective. So we could get tougher on countries that ship us cargo in infested pallets. We could revoke, for instance, the faith has suggested this, so we should revoke their right. Uh, if, if a country is repeatedly ship, shipping us in infested pallets, we should revo revoke their right to use wooden packaging material in the things that they send us. Uh, we could also get tougher on importers uh, so that they can look back into their supply chains uh, to make sure the wood packaging that they're using is not infested with pests. So, you know, essentially the importer can look back into where they're getting this, this wood packaging material and make sure that it's been sufficiently treated. There is some good, good news on this front, though, because um, uh, both uh, Faith and her group and our group called for stronger enforcement, in particular for customs to, to take stronger enforcement action, and they did this, actually. In late 2017, uh, customs really toughened up its enforcement of these wood packaging regulations, started fining uh, importers every time they found a pest in the, in the pallets. Uh, and those fines can be large. Uh, and they can also turn the ship around and send it back to where it came from. So CBP is, uh, pardon me, I'm saying CBP, that's Customs and Border Protection. Uh, they're part of the Department of Homeland Security, and they are the ones who do the inspections at the ports. Uh, so this, uh, this has helped a lot. So we've talked to a lot of shipping companies and they're all of a sudden very concerned about whether there's pests in their pallets and they're uh, trying to find ways to look back into their supply chains to try to keep them out because it's costing them money. Um, so I mentioned that, that you know, that's the stronger enforcement is another um, plank in the uh, policy uh, uh, suggestions that we had uh, in Tree Smart Trade. So one, of, one of the uh, interesting issues is that while customs has greatly increased its enforcement, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has not. And yet, who is supposed to be responsible and caring about our trees? Um, for those of you in the New York area, uh, using the figures that Gary outlined earlier, uh, about 1,500 shipments per month are probably coming into New York with a pest in the wood packaging. Hmm. Uh, the, the key port from which things come from Asia, of course, or for most of the world, but especially Asia is Long Beach, uh, Los Angeles, Long Beach, and they're getting probably 6,000 shipments per month with uh, a life passed in the wood based on those calculations. So just think where the next one's gonna show up and what it's gonna be chewing on. Yeah, well, that's the scary part is what is the next pest? What's the one that's getting unloaded from a ship right now? So um, yeah, I'll stop. And all, all, US port, all USC ports expect volumes to rise. And, and I should point out that, you know, they do inspect these things coming in, but they only inspect one to 2% of yeah. the shipments coming in. There's just too many coming in for them to inspect them all. So, you know, it's only a small proportion of what comes in that's actually being inspected. And nearly all the ones that they find infested have the stamp on them that says they were treated according to the international standard. So there's a great deal of fraud probably going on out there also. And again, we need some we need some enforcement muscle to deal with this problem. This would be fraud by the exporting country, not by the U.S. importers. But we're it's a co complex situation, and I think um, you know it's, it's important for us to think about all, all to think about how you know the reason all this trade is happening is because we want these goods that are being produced elsewhere. So it's kind of a you know we don't often think about our regulatory system, but it is one that's put in place you know, to, to meet, try to meet um, the needs of the global economy. Um, I want to segue a bit to, you know, we've been talking recently 
about how to keep new insects and diseases out. But we also, as has been noted, have hundreds of insects and diseases already here, and we need to address these. And Susan, I'm, I'm intrigued by um, sudden oak death. It certainly sounds scary because when I look out my window here in Maryland, I see a bunch of oak trees. It's a very important tree in the east. Um, so far, as far as I know, it's uh, sudden oak death is limited to the west, but um, obviously could make its way here. Can you tell us a little bit more about this disease that you work on, sort of what causes it, what does it do to oak trees, and what are you doing, you and your colleagues, to try to address it? If that's right. Right now in the forest, the only places that have it are uh, the coast of California and the southern coast of Oregon. And also, it's interesting in um, England, Ireland, Scotland, they have the same pathogen, but it's on larch, which is a conifer, and it's causing a lot of damage there. So the pathogen, um, it's a fungus-like organism. It's actually a brown algae. Uh, it likes water, and it actually uh, swims, has a tail and swims. And um, so why would an organism that likes water, lives in water, bother uh, intacting plants? But uh, it does really these phytophthoras are some of the worst pathogens of uh, not only forests, but also agriculture and horticulture. And really, we know that this pathogen came in uh, to the United States from Asia on nursery plants. So part of the problem is this pathogen has a wide host range. It gets on rhododendrons, it gets on camellias, it gets on you know, pieris, so a lot of very, very popular nursery plants. And um, it first was recognized in the United States about 25 years ago. Um, a nursery person down in Santa Cruz, south of San Francisco, uh, started contacting his local newspaper saying, the trees are dying in Santa Cruz. You know, the trees are dying. And when we went down and looked at the situation and told him that we thought the cause of the dead trees in Santa Cruz was actually in his nursery, he told us, thanks, and uh, we'll talk to you later. And I can't blame him for, um, you know, being frustrated. Nobody knew what was going on and, uh, you know, it wasn't his fault. But what did happen is um, plants from that nursery in Santa Cruz were planted at very high end resort in Big Sur area. Then this pathogen, it can move like from the rhododendron when it rains it blows in the wind in the raindrop and hits the trees. It moved into the Los Padres National Forest and it has gone on to kill 50 million trees uh, or really more, but that's the estimate we have. Uh, extremely frustrating problem placed under quarantine, nursery plants, uh, wood products, spices, Christmas trees, you know, all kinds of plants. And it's been extremely frustrating because despite the quarantine, we still get like new variants like COVID that come in and um, introduced into Oregon, introduced recently in Northern California. Um, and despite heroic efforts on the parts of many and mandatory eradication programs in Oregon, federally and state funded, um, the pathogen is gone, you know, breaks out so really in California now, we are really doing what we call mitigation, where people um, basically plow down whatever's left of this forest that has been destroyed and try to restart with climate smart um, species that are less susceptible. Um, it, and it's really, you know, tribal people, rec you know, use acorns from these oaks, uh, the beautiful trees. It's in an urban area. You know, there's what, 7 million people in the Bay Area moving around and living amongst these hazards. 
it's been, it's just terrible. I can see it out my window, it's mm -hmm. horrible. One thing that Susan didn't uh, get into is that because it's sudden oak death um, lives on so many plants in the nursery trade, it fairly frequently gets shipped, off, shipped around to nurseries in other states. And uh, two years ago, there was a major problem of uh, infected plants being shipped out of the West Coast to at least 100 different nurseries in 14 states. Um, it cost those states and their nurseries millions of dollars to track down those infected plants, destroy them, chase, chase around trying to find them all, but well, many of them had already been sold. Um, and USDA says, has, has had regulations in effect for 20 something years that's supposed to prevent this from happening, but it didn't. And from my point of view, the report they did analyzing what went wrong left more questions than it answered. Um, in fact, they've never even published a list of all the states that received infected plants. So one has to wonder how hard they're really trying. There was an article in the New Republic, uh, was that last week or the week before, by a woman named Ellie Setchett that does a really good job of describing this disaster in the nursery trade, if people want to look that up. Yeah, so one of the big questions is, will this ever get to the East? And really the purpose of the quarantines in large part is to protect the beautiful oak forests in the Midwest and Southeast. And um, I personally think that a lot of the conditions needed for this pest are present in the Appalachian Mountains um, in many parts of the US. Um, the pathogen has been known. We had a big sh inadvertent shipment in 2004. So that was, you know, 15, more than 15 years ago. Many places in the East we know were exposed. And um, the pathogen has not broken out as a forest disease, but it has run out of nurseries in the water from the nurseries. And it is present in rivers uh, in New York has one river infested, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Texas, uh, Georgia, Alabama. Then you need a flood and uh, you know exposure to plants. Mm -hmm. It's a little worrisome. So I do, I want to, um, it, both in the interest of time and also just to make sure that we uh, get to some hopeful things. Um, <laughs> so, with pretty much all of the um, major forest pests that have arrived here, um, scientists are working on them. Scientists love to solve problems. I, I know from talking to scientists, there's nothing they like more than a really hard problem to sink their teeth into. Um, and in my time writing about the, these issues, I've talked to folks breeding um, trees to try to breed a more resistant tree. I've talked to people using genetic engineering to uh, develop a resistant tree. I've talked to people who go out and find insects in Asia and bring them here uh, and then try to release them so that they will go after um, the problems, insects that we already have, like hemlock, willy adelgid, and emerald ash borer. Um, so my question is, are, are these strategies working? Um, are, are we seeing progress? Are, is it possible that some of these trees could be saved or could be brought back? Um, and also, could there be unintended side effects or consequences from, from these strategies? So Gary, I'm gonna throw this one to you first. What, what do you think? Hey, yes, so, so for the diseases that are already here, these kinds of strategies, particularly biological control, which is releasing an enemy of the, of the pest that's already here, uh, that's the, kind of our only hope to save um, trees from those sorts of pests. Uh, and um, so, but, the, but it has some, it's, it's certainly risky because it, it provides some danger. You're bringing in another insect or disease to, to combat the one that's already here. Uh, so that, that is some, so there are some problems with that, but, but also, um, you know, it uh, is only, you know, it's only partially been successful. So many of the uh, uh, attempts to have biological control uh, 
uh, on on insect pests have have not been too successful. So it's a uh, it's a risky pop, uh, proposition and not a sure thing by any means. But I think in terms of uh, breeding, maybe we should have Faith talk about that. Well, the the issue of breeding is starting to get a fair amount of attention, but it's not getting money. <laughs> which is pretty crucial to actually having things happen. Chestnut has had 80 years of people trying to breed a resistant chestnut. In the last 10 or 15 years, they've utilized modern molecular techniques and even transgenic trees and that looking promising. Um, but we, it's still a little too early to tell, but attempts to breed uh, hemlocks have not so far proved successful. They're, they're working on ash. Um, but the real problem, I think, is that most of these projects are little kind of hobby projects, someone described them to me as. Uh, scientists believe in them and they struggle to carry them out, but they can't get the kind of resources that they need to uh, carry them through. It takes, it takes a long time to identify the genetic in, uh, structures that you think are hope, helpful and then to breed them in, whether using transgenic methods or traditional breeding. And then it takes a while to find out whether they're working. And then it's going to take even longer if they appear to be working to bulk up the, the numbers of uh, seedlings that you have to put out in the woods. And then you have to manage those. So it's, uh, it, takes, it takes years, it's a complex project. There is a bill in Congress, H.R. 1389, introduced by uh, Representative Welch of Vermont, and it has seven or eight co-sponsors now, um, that attempts to provide more stable funding for these programs. Uh, I urge people to take a look at it, and uh, if they like it, to ask their member of Congress and their senators to, uh, support, to support the bill and to introduce a Senate version. But right now, I think breeding has a lot of promise if we can find ways to fund it. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Um, I think a lot, if not virtually all of these efforts are federally funded. Um, there's, there's few other sources of funding that, that I know of at least that, that support this. Um, so it's really our, our, our government that's um, kind of supporting the work to the extent that it is. Um, uh, Gabe, okay. I would interrupt just to say it's our government. If we want them to do something, we should tell them. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so um, in interest of time, we're just gonna have one more prepared question and then um, we'll try to get a few questions from the audience answered. And this last question is one that I hadn't thought about too much until recently, but um, in addition, you know, we've talked about these kind of big picture sort of pathways that pests bring pests into the country, the horticulture trade and these big container ships, you know, it, us as individuals, we as individuals don't necessarily have too much direct control over that, but we do have control over what we um, order on the internet with, you know, one click shopping and what we may bring back from abroad on our, our trips. And these, I've, I've heard from folks, including on the panel and, and elsewhere, that this, there's a lot of concern about kind of what e-commerce and, and just folks, you know, getting on airplanes may be bringing into the country. Um, just about anything is available today on the internet. So I just want to ask any of the panelists your thoughts on what is our responsibility as individuals and consumers and what can we be doing to lessen the threat of introducing the next emerald ash borer or sudden oak death or something like that? Well, one of the uh, easiest things is to avoid moving firewood. That, that doesn't avoid bringing a new one in, but it avoids moving them around inside the country. Emerald ash borer has certainly been moved by people taking firewood from a tree in their yard that had to be cut down, a dead ash tree, and then uh, saying, oh, I've got a summer cabin up in the woods somewhere, and they load the wood into the car or the truck and drag it up there. Uh, so don't do that. Uh, there's quite a lot of information on the web, and states are very actively pursuing 
outreach and educational efforts about not moving firewood. Yeah. Um, for me, when I think about it, um, policy is very important for these issues. And believe it or not, it really is in large part driven by public opinion. And uh, I want to thank everyone that's listening and engaged on this issue and encourage you to talk with your friends, you know, wherever you go, share your concerns for invasive species spread. Uh, it, it really makes a difference. Yeah, I, I, I would uh, add to what Susan's saying. I think she's, she's absolutely right that um, uh, public opinion makes a big difference if we want to change policy. When I speak to legislators in Washington or to the people, people in general, uh, they're, they're only minimally aware of this problem um, and they don't see it as a problem that can be solved. But in fact, there, there are ways that we can, we can help solve this problem. And, uh, and so I think that um, you know, speaking up uh, as a citizen is one of the most important things you can do. Uh, Susan was suggesting you speak to everybody you can find just to raise awareness, but it's also worthwhile speaking to your congressional representatives because they eventually essentially have the levers of power there, but also speaking to environmental uh, NGOs like uh, the Nature Conservancy and other NGOs who are not, they're, you know, they're somewhat engaged in this issue, but they haven't been a strong force in policy and they, they need to hear from their members that this is important. Uh, one thing we're trying to do is to bring this uh, great to the attention of Congress more directly by through a petition uh, that um, asks that um, the agricultural committees of the House and Senate uh, hold hearings on this issue. So that would the hearings would allow uh, uh, experts to testify and to raise the awareness of this issue on on Capitol Hill and what can be done about it. So if if you'd like to sign that petition that's going to the agricultural committees of the, of the House and Senate. You can see that, um, that uh, address on your screen, change.org, stop forest pests, and uh, sign that petition. That, that will help out. That's one way that you can help. Great. Um, so we have a few great questions from the audience. And in the last few minutes, I want to try to address a few of these. And one of them, I think, is one that often gets lost We you know in this kind of high-level discussions. Um, a lot of people have some of these trees on their property and um, in, in many places, like I think upstate New York, correct me if I'm wrong, also the Midwest and, and parts of New England, um, some of these pests like the Adelge and then the ash borer haven't, haven't totally um, wiped out the trees in part because the cold winters um, so far at least have been slowing down the spread of some of these insects. So. I, I, any of the panelists, um, if, if folks have uh, hemlock trees or ash trees and they want to take action, um, what should they be doing and sort of when should they be doing it? Um, I, I've, I've heard and it'd be great to hear your all's thoughts that um, if somebody's going to treat their trees, they kind of need to do it before the insect arrives and, and reproduces and, and gets to large populations. Like if you wait till you're seeing your trees dying, it's, it's probably already too late. Is that accurate? Susan, you want to try that one? Um, well, I'm not on the East Coast, so I'm less familiar with, you know, at the adelgid and the ash. But in general, unfortunately, it is very true that prevention, like preventative treatments, we have preventative treatments for, for sudden oak death, um, or sometimes even uh, people try prevent preemptive removal, which would be you know actually cutting down the trees to help you know, create a barrier zone so the pest can't move forward. But you're throwing away what you're trying to save. Um, so in general, uh, the earlier and really what I would encourage people to do is really keep an eye on their trees. Um, realize that if you have a tree, it's a big responsibility. It, it requires a, attention and um, keep watching and then look for cooperative, use, cooperative extension um, can often be very helpful. And state ag departments often have people that can help if you have questions. 
Yeah, I mean, that's good. And I, I would add that, um, you know, if you have uh, specimen trees on your property that you really want to save, uh, they can be treated with insecticide. You should get them early, you know, soon after the sign of the, of the disease. But, you know, keep in mind that those insecticides that are being used have environmental effects also. Many of the ones being used against emerald ash borer uh, uh, kill other insects as well. So it's not without um, impact when you add those, um, those insecticides. That's for trees that you, you particularly want to keep alive because they are in some particular uh, prominent place on your property. Uh, if it's a lot of tree, if you're talking about a lot of trees in the forest, there's really not much you can do. I do want to say uh, a note of hope. I, I was just walking this morning in a local park. There's a, a, a really large white ash tree. Um, and I, I go by it often and, and just look at it, check on it. And it seems to be really healthy. And I, I know that's because it's being treated. If it weren't being treated, it would have died years ago from the ash borer. So uh, to me, it's a lesson that if, you know, in this case, it's a, a city park, but whoever owns a tree, if, if you really want to keep that tree alive, um, it is possible. Um, obviously, you need to kind of reach out to, as, as Susan said, extension or somebody who kind of knows what they're doing and, and get, get some good advice, but it is possible to, to save individual trees. And I think that's, uh, get, that gives me some hope. Um, another interesting question we got is, has any imported pest within the U.S. been 100% eradicated? Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> well, in, agri in any would include agriculture, and some of those might have been, although even with high profile ones like uh, fruit flies, they have to go back and they keep they either keep getting reintroduced or they didn't quite get rid of them because they have to do the whole program over and over again. But in the forests, no. A few have been reduced to, so that they're no longer that damaging. Uh, they, they seem to be making a lot of success with winter moth in New England, for example. But, uh, but yes, I, you I, know, I oh, go ahead. Um, really, when sudden oak death first arrived, so this would be, um, about in the 90s, there was a great debate of, you know, can we ever eradicate this pathogen? And uh, Oregon really caught it a little earlier than California, and so Oregon set out to eradicate it. They didn't eradicate it, but they slowed the spread, and they really gained decades of life for the forests, you know, just beyond the infestations. And so there's a lot that can be done uh, to extend life and you know help the forest, even if you don't eradicate it, but you can slow the spread. That's or an prevention. I, I, I should amend. I should amend my statement. They have eradicated the Asian longhorn beetle in five or six different places. In well, yeah, I would just I would just say that that uh, you know if the infestation is small and uh, fairly well circumscribed, they do go in and eradicate it, and it has been successful. I'm also thinking about citrus longhorn beetle faith. Uh, sure. And that's that small uh, infestation. But once it's widespread, we're not talking about eradication anymore. We're talking about managing it to try to minimize the damage. Right. I think we have time for just one more question. And several people have asked about the pallets. Why why can't we just go to all plastic or or some something else other than wood? And I, I just want to, you know, you know, make the point I because I included this, you know, as a possible solution in my. New York Times op-ed and somebody wrote to me and said, well, you know, a lot of forest owners um, actually um, sort of depend on the income from forest products in general, of which pallets are a significant one. And, and that if we somehow transitioned to all plastic pellets, well, that would hurt um, the millions, potentially millions of forest owners in the US and obviously using plastics has its own uh, consequences. So um, it just kind of made me think, or reminded me that there's always trade-offs um, every time you try to move from one kind of product to another, um, you, it, it, it can ripple through supply chains. So I just wonder, um, I mean, is going to all plastic pallets the, the best solution? Are there other kind of other ways to think about this? 
Yeah, I don't think it's I don't think it's the best solution just because of the impacts of of, of plastics. Uh, now, the, all the pallets that I know about are made of recycled plastic, so they're actually using plastic that's already been used and and might otherwise end up in the ocean or something. So they're not as horrible as you might think, but. Uh, I think the, the pharmaceutical and food industries do a lot of uh, use of plastic uh, pallets because they're easier to clean. But wood is really the dominant here. And let, let's, let's, let's be, be straight for the insects that are in our country, it's not American pallets that are the problem. Those are being shipped out, right? The, the pallets that are the problem are the ones that are coming in from, from other countries. And so US uh, forest products industry uh, would, would only have a problem if there was an international ban on, on use of, of, of wood pallets. And that's, that's really unlikely to happen just because, as I said, something like 95% of the piles, pallets being used in the, in the world are, are wood. I think we could keep the, the um, uh, wood products industry involved and, and help solve the problem by using manufactured wood materials. So plywood, OSB, other manufactured wood materials. The insects are killed when that processing happens. It's still using wood products. Uh, so uh, it would keep, uh, be a market for the forest products industry. So I think that's a possibility. And I know of other companies that are just not using pallets at all. They've shifted to just loading the containers straight without pallets in them. Or with slip sheets, very thin things. Yeah. I, Gary, you're right about all that. I would like to reiterate what you just said, though. Most of the pallets are being made from recycled plastic. And we all know, and Cary Institute's going to have a session later on about the disaster we have with plastic being dumped everywhere. We have more plastic than we know what to do with in this world. And four people knee jerk their way out of plastics as shipping materials. I think there's stuff uh, or an approach that should be explored at least. Is there a market? Most of these plastics you can't recycle into anything useful so they end up in a landfill or in the ocean or wherever. But mm -hmm. is there a way to make them into something useful that would reduce to some extent anyway, both the plastic pollution and the insect risk? Yeah. But if we, if we had really aggressive enforcement this problem would be, the pest problem would be reduced. And that doesn't contribute to supply chain problems or loss of income for forest owners or other issues that people keep raising. Well, really, you know, earlier we were saying, what can you do, you know, as an individual? Most of these invasive pests were actually discovered by people just on their backyard trees. Yeah. So, um, you know, I was, you know, one thing that could help is if we had more people uh, looking on whatever level, um, you know, working for state ag departments, doing trapping and all those kinds of things, but even just, uh, you know, keep an eye out and ask questions when you see something that's unusual. Yeah, there's a lot of information on the web now and a lot of uh, citizen science groups that are promoting exactly that. and. Yeah, that's how they're discovered. <laughs> yeah, there's actually an app called TreeSnap that you can download and um, I, the, the um, developer of the app are looking for um, reports of several different invasive pests. Um, I haven't used it personally, I'm just aware of it. Well, unfortunately, we're, I'm sure we could go on for a long, long time talking about these fascinating issues. And I, I, I just wanna note how it, you know, this, this issue touches on so many things. We're talking about global trade, we're talking about domestic trade, policy. Um, it's really uh, a, a multifaceted issue with, with um, lots of impacts and ramifications for so many aspects of our society. And that's what, you know, partly what makes it so fascinating for me. Anyhow, um, I do want to thank our uh, great panelists. Uh, thank the Cary Institute for hosting this important dialogue and thank everyone for attending and spending some of your evening with us. Um, I'll just, uh, if any of the panelists, Gary, if you have anything, final words uh, on behalf of the Cary Institute, otherwise I think uh, we can call it a night. No, I, that's fine. Thank you very much, Gabe, for, for moderating this. And I think there will be some words from the Cary Institute. Laurie, do you? have something to say? 
So we um, we are all set for the evening. If, if folks are interested in coming to Cary Institute's next event that Faith mentioned on plastics on May 20th, we have an event on plastic pollution featuring Michael St. Clements. And you can go to caryinstitute.org backslash events to sign up for that. And there's a panel up on the screen right now with that event. And as I mentioned earlier, we also have a forest management workshop series that is running. So if you go to the Care Institute backslash events page, there is another session on May 11th, and that is actually exploring threats to Northeastern forests. So folks on the call tonight that are in the Northeast, that might be of interest. So we hope to see you at either of those. And thank you all very much for tuning in tonight. And until next time. Hello, everybody.